Hi. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I think is essential to understand about machine learning is, is sort of the state that the field is in. Um, I, I think that the state uh, that the field is in is, is preliminary. So um, Sam got up and he, and he told you about uh, some useful way to, to go about trying to solve a problem. And I'm going to tell you about a way that I found useful for solving learning problems. And um, it, it's a different way, not entirely compatible. Uh, and it, it, it's not clear at all what is, what is going to end up being the right way. Um, so part of the reason why I'm telling you this is that uh, I'd like to encourage you to, uh, to ask questions. It's entirely appropriate to ask questions. Uh, it's entirely appropriate to ask hard questions. Uh, okay, so this is about uh, learning reductions. Uh, this, is some, this is stuff that I've worked on with uh, a number of other people. Um, how's it go? Okay, so let's say that uh, you're trying to solve some learning problems. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you work for some charity. And one of the things that charities do is they, they send out mails to people and they say, please give us money, right? So um, the, the envelope and, and the, the postage costs a little bit of money uh, to the charity. And, and so there's kind of an optimization problem to solve here. Who are you going to mail and ask money from? If you're going to ask, if you send mail to everyone in the world, then maybe maybe your budget is broken. Uh, uh, but if you figure out who to send money, who's likely to, do, to donate, and you send mail to them, then, then maybe you do, uh, maybe you, you come out positive. So we're going to try to do machine learning for some sort of charity. Um, and so maybe we could try to apply binary classification. We just try to predict. Is this person going to donate money or not? Right, and um, maybe we get a pretty good predictor, and then we uh, we, we mail out the envelopes, and um, we, we discover that we just barely break even in the real world. Right, so it's kind of a bummer. Um, so there's a problem here, right? Here's another. Uh, uh, situation which comes up. Maybe uh, we we're working for a doctor, and the doctor wants some mechanism for predicting whether or not somebody has cancer. So uh, maybe you decide to use a support vector machine. And, um, and then, then you apply your support vector machine, you get some sort of predictor of whether or not there's cancer, and, and then uh, you, you go and you show it to the doctor, and the doctor says, no, 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 I, I don't want it to tell me whether or not there's cancer. I want it to tell me the probability that there's cancer, right? So then maybe you, you take your support vector machine. So this is, this is a little bit out of sequence in some sense because people are going to be talking about support vector machines more thoroughly. But y you can peer into inside of what a support vector machine is doing, and you can extract some number called a margin. And uh, then you can, you can kind of, it, the margin is kind of like a, a confidence that, that you have uh, the confidence in your prediction. And then uh, you, you can return that, and you call that a probability. And then it, it might turn out that um, these, these probabilities just aren't well calibrated. They're always, you're always getting probabilities that are near 0.5 that your prediction is correct, or something like that. Um, and then you lose, um, because you, you're, not, you're not managing to do what, what the doctor wants. I guess, in case you ever end up with cancer, you really want to get that right. Uh, so uh, the question is, um, what, what's going wrong here? Um, and th there's a, f a very common failure mode that a lot of learning algorithms fall into. There's sort of certain set problems that we know how to attack. We have tools to attack. We go out and we try to apply the, these, these set tools to, to uh, the, the world's problems. And it turns out there's a mismatch because the problem that the world is imposing is not the problem that, that your tool is actually made to solve. Um, so there's sort of two ways we can try to go on beyond this. One of them is we could try to design a, a new algorithm for every problem in the real world. Um, this is sort of great for learning research. Um, and, and the other approach is to try to figure out some way to reuse your old algorithms to solve these new problems. So I'm going to be talking about this approach, right? How do we take uh, sort of some sort of standardized learning machine 
and use it over and over again to solve a, bunch, a wide array of different kinds of problems. This is a question that somebody should ask. All right, so somebody uh, needs to test the system. If you push the button, does the camera actually focus on you? <laughs> Sam, test the system. John, can number two do everything that number one can? I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, we didn't get a camera, though. Interesting. Okay. Um, all right. So what I'm telling you about is, um, is, is another way to think about how to solve problems. And it has particular strengths and weaknesses of its own. So I, I think probably uh, the biggest weakness is related to this question. So if you're in a situation where you have a very small amount of data, that means you're going you're gonna to have to have sort of a, some, some kind of, of strong prior information in order to succeed. And then the, the, the approach that Sam talked about earlier is probably pretty reasonable. Um, if you're in a situation where you have a lot of data, then uh, often the approach I'm going to talk about will end up being useful to you. Okay, so um, what are these learning reductions? So we're, we're going to think about how to reuse an algorithm to solve a bunch of different problems. So there's several things which are several, several properties of this approach. Um, one of them is that it's, it's reductionist. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just go through each of these individually. Uh, okay, so there are a lot of good things which are reductionist. Um, one of them is, is we figured out how to kind of reduce the process of computation to transistors. This has turned out to be extremely useful to all of us. Uh, we, we figured out how to reduce the rendering of scenes to rendering triangles. So uh, um, when, when people are, are building models that they render, they're often actually just turning everything into a zillion triangles and then rendering the triangles. And much of science is also uh, kind of taking a reductionist approach. We try to figure out some kind of core problem, we figure out how to solve the core problem, and we figure out how to use that solution over and over and over again to solve lots and lots of different problems. Okay. So the, these reductions are sort of elemental. Um, you need to know... Nothing, ah, right. So we're going to come up with some kind of mathematics which lets us describe what is a good reduction. And this definition of, of what is a good reduction is sort of not going to depend too much on, on the particular learning algorithm that we reduce to. So we'll be able to apply uh, a decision tree or a support vector machine or a neural network or a logistic regression uh, or, or, or any of many different uh, sub-algorithms. So we're going to end up with a bunch of little components that we can kind of plug together. This, this, this seems uh, kind of minor, but it, it turns out to be extremely important. Um, and, and the reason why it turns out to be extremely important is that it turns out that, that writing good, fast code isn't that easy. Uh, so we get to sort of reuse good, fast code, which, which gives you a, a big advantage. Okay, uh, Okay. so th I'm going to claim this approach is pretty easy. Uh, there's sort of three steps you want to fo follow in solving things by reduction. The first step is you're going to identify your learning problem. So uh, this, is, this is kind of an important step. Um, and it's a step that people actually get wrong pretty often for uh, the reason that Sam said earlier. So he said that you know, sometimes you lie to yourself about what the loss function is, right? Uh, now, it, it's almost hard not to lie to yourself about what the loss function is, but 
Instead, what we want to do is we want to sit down and we want to really think about what our loss function is. So maybe I'll go back to here. Okay, so we're working for a charity. And we're trying to mail out envelopes. Um, and we're going to ask for money in the envelopes. We're going to get some variable amount of money back from the people that we ask. It could be zero, it could be five dollars, it could be two hundred dollars, it could be whatever. So, uh, what is our loss function here? It's how much money you get back. Right. <clears throat> so, our, our goal is to maximize the amount of money that we get back. So, for any particular individual possibility, we can choose to mail the envelope, and if we get no money back, then we'll, we'll kind of have some sort of negative return. And if we uh, get $5 back, then we can get $5 minus the cost of the envelope back, and, and so forth, right? So this is, it, it's not just about estimating whether or not we'll get money back. It, it, there's some sort of quantity involved here. So this is, this is what I would call importance-weighted classification. And this one, uh, similarly, it turns out maybe you're interested in uh, conditional class probability estimation, right? Rather than just classification. <clears throat> okay, so maybe now we've sat down and we've thought about what the real problem is. Um, what you can probably do, or at least... I hope it's probable, is you can go out and you can just see it, find a reduction that somebody's already made, and you can apply this reduction to some uh, simple learning algorithms, and you can just try it and see if it works. Right? So it would be a very quick test. Um, and uh, if it's not necessarily pre-made, then you have to actually create the reduction. And maybe creating a reduction is as hard as, as creating uh, one learning algorithm. Oh, and I guess once you find this reduction, you just you just build your predictor using the, the reduction. Okay, so uh, this is enough of the overview stuff. Uh, and now what I would like to do is I'd like to tell you how to take various learning problems and reduce them to binary classification. Um, there's, there's a question somebody should ask, um, which is uh, why binary classification? And uh, the answer is it was because it was what I was familiar with. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the approach that I'm, I'm telling you about, this reductions approach, you can reduce to anything that you want. Right? And the only question is, do you have a good tool for solving whatever you reduce to? So another very natural and, and compelling candidate would be squared error regression. Okay, so uh, importance weighted classification. So first of all, we need to define precisely what the problem that we're reducing from and to. Uh, so the one that we're going to reduce to is classification. Uh, so the way we define a classification problem is we say, suppose we have some probability measure on features across a single bit. then uh, we're going to try to find a classifier which maps the features to, uh, to that bit value. Is there? You said you put it over here. No. Oh. Interesting. Oh, well. In the case. Um. Now, it would be really great if I had, like, a, a three-way laser pointer, and then I could get them all. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, we have this, this measure, D. This is some probability measure. If, it, it could turn out that for every value of X, there's only a unique value of 0 or 1, which ha has a, a positive probability, right? And then, then 
then in that particular case, there's a, there exists some function from x to 0, 1, which is perfect. It has a zero error rate. So the, the way we measure errors in classification is we say, um, what is the probability under a random draw from D that the classifier is wrong? It's very natural. This is zero, one loss. Um, so when we're trying to do machine learning, we're going to be given a bunch of examples, which are hopefully drawn from D. Uh, then we're going to try to find some classifier C, which has a small error rate. Maybe now you start to see why I reduced the classification. This is sort of, I don't know, it, it seems like it's the most simple learning problem you could, you could have, just predicting one bit. Um, and the, the tricky thing, of course, is that all we have are these examples. We don't actually know what the distribution is. So this is kind of impossible in general without some kind of prior information. But, but maybe, it's, 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 maybe we do have some prior information. So, so maybe it turns out to be possible for the problems that we actually care about. All right. Uh, importance weighted classification is the same as binary classification except for one small difference. The, the distribution is over the same thing as before, but also there's this positive real number. This, this number I'll call the importance. So, for example, in, in the charity uh, application, this would be, so if you have zero return, then it would be just the, uh, the cost of the envelope and uh, for a particular example. And if you get $5 back, then the importance would be $5 minus the cost of the envelope. Right? And then uh, we're going to have some, ooh, this should be a cross there. Uh, we're going to have an importance-weighted data set, and now we're going to try to find a classifier C, which has a small importance-weighted loss. So an importance-weighted loss is just going to be so uh, I guess this is a basic fact of, of probabilities. Is I, I could rewrite this probability is the expectation of the indicator function of whether or not the classifier was wrong. So indicator function is just one if the argument's true. Okay, so this is this is almost the same except now I have this importance value, the, the little i, and I'm going to weight individual examples according to the importance value. All right, um, so there's a very basic theorem. This, this theorem is, is so basic that nobody can claim it. Uh, the, the basic theorem is that for any classifier and for any importance weighted distribution, there's this other distribution, d prime, which is the same as the old distribution, except now you kind of upweight by the importance and you divide by the expected importance. Um, and then the claim is that the binary error rate on D prime times the expected importance equals the importance weighted uh, error rate. So this is, this is a very uh, basic insight. Um, and it turns out that it's extremely useful. Um, because what this says is that if you find a good classifier C for D prime, then you're also finding a good classifier C for D, the original importance weighted problem. The proof of this is, is, is pretty simple. Um, I guess, so you have the importance uh, weighted loss of C on D. You can just write out what this means. So we have, so the importance weighted loss is an expectation. Expectation is a sum where you weight according to the probability of each element. So this is the sum over all triples weighted according to the probability of the triple of the importance times whether or not the classifier uh, got things wrong. And then it turns out you can pull the importance out like this, 
and just have d prime. Because remember, d prime is just this quantity here, right? So this is i d divided by the expected importance. So that's d prime times the expected importance. And then this is an expectation with respect to d prime of the indicated function of classifier being wrong. So that's just a probability. It's just the definition of probability. And then we can rewrite this as the uh, binary error rate. And then it's just exactly the result, right? If all reductions were this simple, it would be a very, very, very nice. Uh, they're not all this simple, um, but we hope they are. <clears throat> okay, so, so th th this theorem gives us some sort of basic insight uh, in into how one problem is related to another problem. And then the question is, how do we take advantage of that algorithmically? So th there's actually... What the theorem says is that if you change the distribution from D to D prime, and then you learn well on D prime, just for zero one loss, you learn well with respect to the importance weighted loss on D. So it's all about how do we change D into D prime, or how do we change samples from D into samples from D prime? Because remember, we only actually get samples. Uh, so one approach people often use is resampling. And I guess the way this works is. Um, you have a bunch of importance weights, one for each uh, example, and uh, you, you kind of play roulette. So you just you, you spin this around, and uh, you know maybe it lands on this example, and then you, you take that example, and you spin it again, and you get another example. Maybe you get the same one, but, but you, you just take it twice in that case. So um, turns out this can have some problems in practice. And the reason why it can have problems is because um, a lot of our learning algorithms are kind of made into the assumption that the samples that they observe are drawn independently, right? And this process uh, breaks that. So in particular, um, if my original samples were independent, they, were, they happened to be independent samples from D, uh, independent importance weighted samples, then if I do a resampling, that's no longer true. And I guess it's easy to see this because if you have, imagine just having a probability distribution on a continuous space, right? So you never see the same sample twice. And if you do resampling on a finite sample set, then you will observe the same sample twice. So obviously something is going weird. So there's another trick. Uh, which turns to fit the requirements that we like. Um, it's, it's just called rejection sampling. And the idea here is we're, we're going to pick some constant, C, which is larger than the importance weight. And then for every sample, we're going to flip a coin with a bias of I over C. So if I is small, then the probability that we come up with heads is, is, is small. Um, and if the result is heads, we keep it, and otherwise we, we're going to throw it away. This is some process, and you can prove that if the original samples were independent, then that after you run rejection sampling in your sample set, the remaining samples will also be independent. Okay, so um, it's something a little bit weird here, which is that we're kind of throwing away some of the information. Um, so maybe um, it's a simple way to fix this. So here's kind of the most naive algorithm that you might imagine. Uh, the algorithm is called costing. It takes as input some importance weighted data set and some binary learning algorithm. And then it, for maybe 10 iterations, you do rejection sampling uh, from the importance weights to get a binary data set with no importance weights. And then you learn a classifier on that binary data set, and you take the majority vote over each of these 10 different classifiers you learned. OK, so this is a very simple algorithm. Uh, just repeated rejection sampling, and then take a majority vote to learn classifiers. It turns out that this algorithm 
uh, works really great for this charity problem. So in uh, 1998, the, the, the conference called KDD had some sort of championship where, where the problem was exactly this. Um, it, it was figuring out how to optimize which, who you're going to send envelopes to to uh, get the most uh, in terms of donations. And um, <clears throat> you can apply uh, this costing reduction. And you, you can ask yourself, what is the total return that, that uh, was received? Uh, and so the, the total return is measured in terms of profit, which is essentially equivalent to expected importance. And you can use different base classifiers. Here's naive Bayes, which uh, Sam talked about. This is boosted naive Bayes. This is just... Uh, what is the... Yeah, I'll, I'll get there in a sec. Um, this is a decision tree, and this is a support vector machine, which you'll hear about later. Okay, so uh, there's actually three things here. There's also something here, and here, and here, and here that you can't see, which has to do with, um, suppose you just ignore the importance weights and you, um, you know, tell your classifier to learn. Um, it turns out that all, all these classifiers tell you that um, it's, it's great to predict that nobody will donate. Um, you, you have very high accuracy, and then um, and, and then you, you don't mail out any envelopes, and then you get no return. Right? Another thing that you can do is you can do the resampling, the, the first resampling approach. That's what the green is. So you can do resampling, and then you can apply uh, your base classifier, or you can do rejection sampling. And it seems that this rejection sampling um, works pretty well. Okay. So, um, unfortunately, we, we came up with this after 1998 um, uh, because uh, I guess we would have won. You should always kind of take these things with a grain of salt because, you know, a after the fact, it, these championships that are run in machine learning, are, I think, are actually great. Um, and, and after the fact, we get to kind of pour over the data set over and over again and, and try our best to overfit to it. All right. Um, oh. Ah. Oh, this is a different data set. Uh, this is, uh, it's a similar task. It's another one of these optimizing um, mailing uh, tasks. And, and now it turns out that you can actually, the, the, the simple approach where we ignore the importance weights actually does give you some return when you're using a naive base classifier. Um, and once again, the, the rejection sampling approach seems to work quite well. Okay, so uh, are there any questions about the importance-weighted approach? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you um, how to reduce regression to classification. So this is a little bit of a weird thing to do because there's lots of great regressors that already exist. So it's, not, no, it's not clear this is... Uh, an essential problem needs to be solved, but you know maybe maybe we're feeling mathematical and we just we want to know if I have a good classifier, do I have a good regressor? Oh, by the way, you could think about going the other way, right? You could you could reduce classification to regression, uh, and this would be pretty easy because uh, you you just use the regressor to estimate the probability that the label is 1 given x. And then you would just threshold. Uh, is the probability above 0.5 or below 0.5? This would give you some kind of good reasonable estimate. Uh, so the other direction turns out to be a little bit more difficult, but it seems that there is actually a fairly natural, simple algorithm for doing this. <clears throat> OK, so first of all, what do I mean by regression? So you have to be kind of careful with this because people mean different things. Um, so what I mean by regression is we have some feature space and we have some Y label, which is now in the range from 0 to 1. So it could be 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 1, 
0.9, whatever. Uh, and then we're going to learn a regressor, which is going to map the features to some continuous value in 0, 1. And the, the learning problem is going to be given examples, which are hopefully drawn from D, but may not be. Uh, find a regressor, H, which has a small squared error. So the squared error is actually a, a pretty interesting choice of, of error measure. Uh, and the reason why it's interesting is that the minimizer of this is the mean. Uh, so you, you want h of x to predict the probability, the, the expected value of y given x. That's what's going to optimize the squared error. So now this is, this is the first step in the reduction. We've identified it some problem. And the question is, can we reduce this to binary classification? Oh, uh, examples where we, we care about regression. Uh, maybe we, we want to estimate the probability of, uh, of cancer, right, uh, given various measurements of a, of a, a patient. Maybe we have some sort of big distributed system. Uh, so we have a bunch of sensors spread out all over the place, and uh, we want to estimate uh, whether or not um, somebody pushed a button, for example. Uh, so each of our different sensors might get different bits of information. And we, we could try to have each individual sensor make a prediction. But if it, if it predicts just a single bit, somehow combining a single bit is, is not... Um, not attractive because it doesn't have enough information to really, I mean, maybe all of our sensors individually think nobody pushed a button, um, but if each of them happens to think that, you know, with probably 0.49, somebody pushed a button, if we knew all that information together, if we could get all that information together, then we would perhaps believe that somebody had pushed the button. Uh, all right. Okay. We're going to start with a basic observation. Uh, let's pick some threshold in the interval between 0 and 1. Let's take a sample. So this, this is a, a regression sample, which means y varies between 0 and 1. And let's form an importance weighted sample of the form, here are my features. Is the y value greater than the threshold or not? So this is the binary label. And, uh, and then we have an importance weight, right? And the importance weight is going to be how far is y from the threshold? And the claim is that if c is perfect, meaning it's going to give us the best possible prediction, then that will mean uh, that when c of x equals 1, the expected value of y given x is going to be greater than t. And you can just, this is easy to work out. Um, so if c of x is 1 and, and, and the classification is, is, is correct, it's, it's doing the best possible, then that implies that, okay, so we, we have two kinds of y's. We have the y's which are greater than the threshold, and we have the y's which are less than the threshold. So when y is greater than the threshold, the importance weight is just going to be y minus t. And when y is less than the threshold, the importance weight will be t minus y. So if, if it's correct to say that the classification is 1, the importance weight of classification is 1, that means that the importance on... Uh, the y's which are above the thresholds, the expected importance on the y's above the thresholds is greater than the expected importance on the y's which are below the thresholds. So you get this inequality. And then uh, we can just subtract this from both sides, and now t minus y becomes uh, y minus t here. And now we just have the expected value. So we have indicator function of y greater than t, 
make an iter function of y. Uh oh, hold on. Ah, that's a bug. The, the inequality doesn't change signs. Okay, so this is uh, indicator function of y less than or equal to t, indicator function of y greater than t, which is everything, and we multiply by the same thing in either case, so this is just expected value of y minus t. And t is a constant, so you end up getting this equation. Okay, so this is, this is another simple observation, and it, it, it tells us, if you think about it, how to do this. So here's an algorithm. This is the algorithm which reduces squared error regression to binary classification. It's a very simple algorithm. Uh, what it does is, uh, <clears throat> okay, so the name of t changed to p. Uh, what, what it does is it, uh, you start with your regression data set. You choose some values of t, uh, some thresholds. And then uh, you form importance-weighted data sets. And then you're going to apply an importance-weighted learning algorithm. You're going to learn a bunch of different binary classifiers. And then uh, at test time, you're going to have some features. You're going to ask each classifier how it predicts given the features. <clears throat> Maybe the predictions will look like this. Maybe, uh, you know, it's almost never the case that the y is greater than 0 0.99, so it's zero. It turns out that um, even that y is typically less than 0 0.5, which means this guy predicts zero. But he's greater than 0 0.1, the y is typically larger than 0 0.1, so this guy predicts one, and this guy predicts one. And then the way we're going to form a regression estimate is by just looking for where this threshold is. Where do we switch from predicting ones to predicting zeros? And then maybe there's some discretization in the system, so maybe we predict the value which is in between these two, which would be 0.3. Nobody's asked the question in at least 10 minutes. Somebody ask a question. There's a few problems with this algorithm. Um, so there, there's some details here. Uh, I said I was reducing this to binary classification, uh, and I actually just reduced it to importance-weighted classification. But I told you how to reduce importance-weighted to binary, so you, you can just apply that uh, previous reduction. And here's your answer, Sam. Uh, if it turns out, and, and this, this could happen very easily, it could be that you get one zero one zero zero zero. So what you do is you just sort. So then you get all ones and then all zeros. Um, that sounds like a hack, but it turns out that that's exactly what the theory tells you to do. And then uh, I guess there's also an issue in sort of how do you discretize on T. Um, we tried using sort of a uniform grid. And it worked pretty well. It works a little bit better if you kind of discretize on demand. So maybe most of your Y values are up near 0 0.9, and then you want to put your discretization in that region. Okay. Um, right, so here's some algorithm. I told you there was some basic observation. And then what can we, oh, first question is how, how well does this algorithm work? Um, and I, I told you this is a little bit of a, a weird uh, question to ask. Can we reduce regression to classification? Because there are a lot of good regressors around. Uh, and some of these, so what this is doing is it's comparing um, various algorithms. Uh, to uh, various algorithms under the probing reduction. So this is naive Bayes with the probing reduction. This is a decision tree with a probing reduction. This is a support vector machine with a probing reduction. 
it's comparing these various algorithms. Uh, to what happens when you use other approaches people use for doing regression. And in particular, um, the kind of problems these are uh, are um, these are really classification problems. So when you're doing regression with classification, you're really trying to estimate the probability that y equals 1 given x. Okay, so some other approaches people use is they just try to apply a naive Bayes classifier straight it, um, and then estimate probabilities. Uh, some people try to use a, a naive ba Bayes classifier, and then instead of reporting the actual probability of the, the y equals 1 given x, that the naive Bayes tells you, that they try to fit some sort of function to that output, uh, typically a sigmoid. <clears throat> Sometimes people try to use a decision tree straight. Um, I, I don't know if, I, I don't think anybody's talking about decision tree here. But the way a decision tree works is very simple. What happens is um, you have a bunch of uh, features, and uh, first you, you have some test. Is, is, the, is the third feature above or below 0.2, right? And this splits your data. And then you have another test. Is, is the second feature above or below 0.7? And that, that splits your data again and again and again. So you keep on splitting your data as you walk down some sort of tree until you get down to the leaves. And then in the leaves, you have some samples remaining. And, and you just ask yourself, what fraction of the samples predict one way versus another? Right? So this is, this is some way to get a, a probabilistic estimate. Um, and then the way you label is you, you just, uh, uh, for a particular example, you have some B. You walk down the tree according to whether or not you're First feature is above, what was it, 0.1? Uh, I don't think that was right. <clears throat> uh, so you just walk down the, tr the tree till you get to a leaf, and then you, you predict whatever um, proportion of the labels were one in that leaf. Okay, so another approach people use is a decision tree with bagging. Uh, how do we describe bagging? Bagging is another very simple approach. It's like um, it's like costing, except the importance weights are all one, and C is, well, no, it, it's more like, I guess, it's like costing, except instead of doing rejection sampling, uh, you have the importance weights all one, and you use resampling rather than rejection sampling. That's the simplest description. And then another approach people use is they, uh, they try to apply a support vector machine. This gives them a pretty good classifier. And then to, to get a, uh, a good prediction, a good probabilistic prediction, they fit a sigmoid to the margin, which is some internal value you can extract from a support vector machine. <clears throat> so the, I guess the way to read this is, um, so this is, we're talking about squared error, which means that smaller is better. And... Uh, for each of these kinds of classifiers, there's, there's several approaches, and the, the la the, the, they're ordered in the same way they are up here, right? So, uh, right there is naive Bayes with, under the probing reduction, and uh, well, I can't. That's naive Bayes under the probing reduction. Uh, this would be naive Bayes uh, under SVM. And this would be naive Bayes under, or, uh, uh, or no, sorry. This would be a support vector machine under the probing reduction. And this would be a decision tree under the probing reduction. And if you take a look, you see this is working reasonably. Um, I think that's about all you can conclude. <clears throat> if you take a look at the exact numbers, it seems like it works a little bit better than other approaches, but maybe not dramatically better. Okay. Um, right, so I, I, I like to try to do some theory. Um, the question is, what can we pro prove about this algorithm? We want to actually prove that, that this algorithm is a valid re reduction from regression to classification. Uh,
So there's a trick which is, is very helpful in thinking about the proof. So we have a bunch of different classifiers. And, and we, we could try to prove something with respect to um, kind of the collection of classifiers that we actually made, but may, maybe there's some uh, way to just think about having one classifier. Uh, it, so it turns out there, there's a trick which lets us do this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to think about adding the threshold T into uh, the feature space. And then we're going to think about, so we have a uh, importance weighted uh, data set for each threshold T. We're going to think about taking a union or, or maybe just a stochastic choice from each of these. And then we're going to learn one classifier with respect to this one sample set. And then we're going to define c sub t of x equals c of x comma t. And so this is a trick. We, we, since we have a bunch of classifiers and we're uh, learning them and, and calling them in parallel, we, we can just put the name of the classifier into the feature space. And then we can ask ourselves, what does a small uh, loss with respect to this classifier, uh, this one, imply? So this is a little bit of a cheat because um, the algorithm that I told you and the algorithm that I'm going to analyze are slightly different, right? Um, and whether or not this is reasonable to do in practice, we don't actually know because um, we didn't do the experiments. But it's extremely helpful theoretically. It makes the theorems much cleaner. You can prove about the same thing if you don't do this trick. Uh, but it, it's, just, it's, it's, it's much nicer uh, if you do. Okay. <clears throat> so now um, we're, we're, we're going to prove a theorem. So the theorem says uh, for every classifier, so th this zero one here is, a, is the threshold, right? So we, we have this one classifier trick. For every classifier of this form, and for every distribution, ooh, ah, this is another typo. This should be uh, a hard bracket, right? Because we're going to have the interval from 0 to 1. Uh, for every distribution, for every regression problem, uh, the squared error of our estimate is going to be bounded by Okay, so now we're, we have a distribution D, which is going to produce samples that we're going to apply this uh, one classifier trick to, which is going to uh, produce a distribution over importance weighted samples, right? And, and then via the costing reduction on just binary samples. So this is, this is kind of a tricky thing. Um, so we don't know what the distribution D is, but the distribution D is implicitly inducing a distribution on just binary classification. And the way that you get at this, this induced distribution, it, the way that you draw from this induced distribution is you first draw from the original distribution D, and then you pick a random threshold T uh, uniformly from 0, 1, and then you um, just create the importance weighted sample, and then you transform the importance weighted sample into a binary sample using the costing reduction. Okay? So, uh, right. So, claim is the error rate of the classifier on this induced distribution minus uh, something bounds of squared error. So if I just told you this theorem, which is true, then, then it, it wouldn't actually be very interesting. And the reason why it wouldn't be very interesting is because we're trying to apply regression in kind of inherently noisy situations. So we need a theorem which is actually going to imply something when we have a lot of noise. Just having, saying I have one error rate bounds another error rate isn't very convincing because 
this error, this error rate will be pretty large when you have a very noisy D. So what you do is you subtract off the smallest possible error rate. Sometimes people call this the Bayes error rate. So you ask yourself, suppose that it chose the best possible classifier. That would have some binary error rate. And it turns out that you can subtract this off. So that it's this difference which bounds a squared error. And the difference is a regret. So typically, the way we think about, the way we define regrets is how well did we do in comparison to how well we could have done. And the claim is that the binary regret bounds the squared error regret. Okay, so, uh, yeah, nice theorem. Um, how do you prove it? So, l before I try to uh, prove it mathematically, let me uh, tell you why you should believe that this is true. Uh, so, let let's think about an extreme case where uh, it happens that w we're just trying to estimate that the, the the probability that y equals 1 given x. So if we're trying to estimate the probability that y equals 1 given x, uh, let's just think about some situations. One situation is where uh, the probability that y equals 1 given x is 1, right? And then uh, as we vary the threshold, the importance weighted loss will look like this line, right? So the, the when the threshold is 1, that the, uh, and the probability that y equals 1 given x is 1, then the, the importance weight will be 0. Because you, the importance weight is just magnitude of y minus t. If y and t are 1, then the importance weight is 0. Another situation is where the probability that y equals 1 given x is 0. So we're, we're always going to be, y will always, is always 0. And now the importance weight is going to look like this. And then the question is, what happens in between? Suppose that the probability that y equals 1 given x is 0.5. What happens? So what happens, what you should expect to happen is a convex combination of this and this. Because you have some probability that y is 1 and some probability that y is 0. Now, it's not quite that, and the reason why it's not quite that is because we're trying to prove a strong theorem. The strong theorem subtracts off the minimum possible error rate, right? So instead of having the green line be like so, it's like so because we subtract off the minimum, which means that it always touches um, zero. So, um, so these are some cases, and, and now what we want to do is we want to think about we want to think about an adversary who's going to choose how to make our classifiers screw up, and, and we're going to place a constraint on our, on our adversary. The constraint is that the classifier cannot take too much importance weighted loss, or you cannot cause too much importance weighted loss. And the question is, what is the most efficient way? for the adversary to disturb our prediction uh, given his budget on the amount of importance weighted loss he can incur. So every, every classifier has some importance, importance weighted loss. Uh, so let's suppose that we're just in this case here, right? So this, the classifier at this threshold will have this much importance weighted loss that he suffers when he predicts wrong. Okay, so uh, there's two observations which make this kind of trivial. Uh, the first observation is that it would be very dumb for the adversary to screw up on this side of the truth and on this side of the truth. And, and the reason why it's very dumb is because we had that sorting operation, right? So if we screw up here, 
then we're going to be turning a 1 into a 0. If we screw up here, we're going to be turning a 0 into a 1. And after we sort, um, these cancel each other out. So it's as if the adversary achieved nothing. Okay, so, um, so that says that all of the mistakes are going to be on one side of the truth in the worst case. And then uh, a second observation is it wouldn't make very much sense for the adversary to mess up here and to not mess up here. Because after we sort, these two are equivalent. And, and the importance weight that the adversary pays is smaller here than it is over here. So it says that the most efficient way for the adversary with a budget to, to disturb our estimate is to just choose one side of the truth and just start erring over and over and over again until uh, he runs out of budget. And then the probing algorithm will report this, the truth will be here. And then this is just something linear, so if we integrate that, we're going to get something squared. So the amount of area here is the amount of budget the adversary has. And it's going to induce some particular squared loss. Okay. Um, that may have been marginally clear. Um, we also have the proof in math. Uh, Okay, so, other questions? This, this is a good page to ask questions about. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go back to this page. If you take a look, uh, the importance weight here the integration of the importance weight is just going to be a half because it's, 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 it's half of this um, uh, unit rectangle, unit square. Okay, so the expected importance is going to be less than or equal to half. So uh, what we're going to do is just going to start writing down what the various definitions mean. So we have this term which is a regret, which is how well we did compared to how well we could have done. And the claim is that this equals this. So we're going to write down the importance weighted loss minus the minimum possible importance weighted loss. Then we're going to multiply by 2. And the reason why we're going to multiply by 2 is because you know the expected importance is less than a half. And then you can go back to the costing theorem. I won't do it now. And remember, there was this relationship where the binary loss uh, times the expected importance equaled the importance-weighted loss. One over a half is two. Okay. Um, what's happening here? What we're going to do is we're going to change around the expectation. So it turns out that the way that you prove these reductions typically is all the action is kind of happening in, in the loss function and in the particular labels. And it doesn't really matter uh, what your features are. So you can just condition on your features. So we're going to pull the expectation over x and t out of uh, the, the full expectation. So we're just kind of reordering how we take the expectation. All right. I feel like I'm going a little bit too fast. Um, let's think about what this means here. So the classifier with the smallest uh, error rate is going to be the one which, okay, so if we predict uh, one uh, then whenever the truth is zero, we're going to pay this kind of importance-weighted loss. Right? So this is just, if the truth is zero, uh, if, if y is less than the threshold, we're going to pay t minus y. Whenever we predict uh, zero, if the truth is one, if uh, y is greater than t, 
the, the amount of loss that we're going to suffer is just y minus t. Right? And, and the best possible classifier is just going to pay the minimum of these two possible losses. Okay. Um, now, we're, we're conditioning on x and t. There's two possibilities. Either the classifier C is going to predict uh, 0 or it's going to predict 1. And it's either going to be right or it's going to be either going to be wrong in this prediction. So if it predicts perfectly, then the difference between the, the loss of the best classifier and, and the loss of our classifier is going to be 0 for this particular choice of x and t. If it predicts incorrectly, then that's not true. And in particular, the difference will be this difference here which you should maybe be remembering from that observation we made earlier. Right, so when C is wrong, the difference between this and this is going to be this minus that magnitude. So we have a minus sign and we have a minus sign so we can just reorder things so we have, to where we have a plus t minus y. And then we have y less than or equal to t and y greater than t, which means this is just t minus the expected value of y given x. And then if you recall, we had that 2 running around. So it says that the cost of the misprediction is t times expected value of y given x. Okay, so all that I've done right here is essentially um, what was obvious from this graph. All that I've done is I've told you that the importance weight, uh, the, the amount of loss suffered for screwing up is something kind of linear in how far you are from the threshold. Right? So this is, if you screw up for this particular t, you look at how far uh, the truth is from the threshold. And then, uh, now we're just going to make the observations that I made earlier uh, in a little bit more mathematical way. Um, actually, they're the, the same observations. Um, so, a good adversary is only going to screw up on one side of the truth because the sorting cancels out things. And he's going to screw up as close to the truth as possible because the loss is linear in the distance of the threshold from the truth. And then um, we have the truth. We're going to have the adversary induce a, uh, a loss of delta. Uh, and we're going to integrate this uh, from the truth to the truth plus delta. Or, yeah. And then um, this integral turns out to be just be delta squared. And that's uh, essentially the proof. All right, so um, are there questions about this theorem? Or it's proof. All right. Um, there's a simple modification of this. So if you go back to the probing algorithm and you modify it very slightly, then you can do quantile regression. So uh, when people are trying to do regression, the, the most common thing they do is, is squared error regression, like we talked about first. Another thing which um, is maybe very useful uh, and which people don't necessarily... I think oftentimes people use squared error regression when they really want to use quantile regression instead. So what, what is quantile regression? Quantile regression is... Uh, so it's going to be parameterized by some q in 0, 1. And we're going to try to predict some value y hat. This is the probability that y is greater than y hat equals q. So 
So if you take this probing algorithm and you just modify it slightly, it turns out that you can get quantile regression. The way you modify it is in terms of the importance weights. So now instead of having, you remember before we had the magnitude of y minus t. Now we just have q when y is greater than t and 1 minus q when y is less than t. And then you can go through and you can prove that this, that the uh, quantile uh, loss uh, is bounded by the binary, uh, the quantile regret is bounded by the binary regret. And the proof is essentially the same. So um, quantile regression is a little bit less used, and, and that means that people haven't had so much time to develop a, a lot of tools to solve it very well. So um, perhaps it's unsurprising then that when you go and you apply this, this uh, quantile regression reduction um, to various binary classifiers, it works pretty well. <coughs> so. Um, for four different data sets and three different choices of quantile, um, we computed, uh, well, we, we, we applied this reduction to, I think, I think the base classifiers were logistic regression and, and one was decision tree. Um, okay, so what is this number here? This, this number is, uh, take the worst guy out of these four possibilities. So this is linear quantile regression. This is kernelized uh, quantile regression. <coughs> and then uh, this quanting algorithm applied to logistic regression, the quanting algorithm applied to decision tree. So you take the, the worst of these four and then uh, divide the performance in terms of the absolute, uh, of, of the quantile loss uh, by the worst, right? So this is a normalized performance. So what this is saying is that using quanting with a decision tree, we got uh, maybe 60% of the loss that we got using uh, linear um, regression. Yeah? John, what exactly do you define as the quantile regression loss? I think I was hoping that you wouldn't ask that question because it turns out that I screwed up this theorem statement. This is actually uh, what you get when you're trying to do median. Um, if you, uh, for a general quantile loss, uh, what you do, well, what, what it's going to look like is essentially uh, this times the magnitude of y minus t and 1 minus q uh, times the magnitude of y minus t. So you're using the normals? Yes. Okay. In terms of this theorem, does hold for the pinball loss for general Q. Um, it's just, well. All right. Um, some experiments. Seems that it works pretty well. Um, there's a significant caveat for the kernel stuff, which uh, Alex is probably interested in. So. Um, there, there are computational problems here. Uh, and the reason why there are computational problems is because we're, these are pretty big data sets. Uh, and when you go and apply a reduction, the actual amount of computation which is going on in the reduction is, is, is relatively small. Most of the, quant the computation goes on inside of the, the learning algorithm that you actually are going to use, right? It turns out that these, these learning algorithms are reasonably well optimized. Um, and they're, they're well optimized enough that they can just handle these, these large data sets. Uh, so you know, I, I guess this algorithm here is very fast. It can handle a large data set. And this algorithm, it's a little bit unfair for us to be comparing to it because uh, we, we couldn't get it to run with, with a very large data set. Uh, I think we could only feed it about 3,000 samples or so. Uh, so 
There's a significant caveat here. You, when you look at, at, the, at the green X, you should be understanding that you know, there's like 50,000 samples here, and it's only seeing 3,000 of them. I agree. Um, so, uh, writing good, fast code takes some effort. Um, we, we know how to do it in specific cases, and um, I, I guess it's just, just if you're practically minded, the question is, um, do you want to <laughs> do you want to be uh, writing good fast code over and over again, or you, do you want to be trying to reuse it? And um, maybe initially you try to reuse it, and then over the long term you try to write good fast code. That's a good solution. Uh, all right, so I think, oh, yeah, I'm about done. Um, there's, there's a couple caveats that which you should understand. So some people worry about log loss, like uh, Sam was talking about log loss. And it's very natural to ask yourselves, um, what does this imply about log loss? And it turns out that it implies nothing interesting. Um, and, and the difficulty is that log loss uh, can be infinite. Um, and, and we don't know how to reduce a loss that could be infinite some of the time to a loss that is bounded. In fact, y you can't do it if, if you allow the predictor that you induce to choose any particular value, right? Because then some very small fraction of the time, the adversary could just choose to cause it to totally screw up and suffer infinite loss. And then the expectation of, uh, of some finite numbers and some infinite numbers is infinite number, and, and that's just pretty unfortunate for the mathematics. Um, another thing that people often try to do is, is they try to, to use regression to estimate, like, uh, say, the relevance of web pages or something like that. And um, and then maybe order web pages uh, according to this relevance value, and um, you you can't prove at least for, for several different natural ranking losses you can't prove anything interesting, and, and the fundamental reason is um, let's say that you have one relevant web page and you have you know a hundred thousand irrelevant web pages this is a fairly typical case <clears throat> then. Um, an adversary who is smart is just going to screw up the, the estimate of the relevance the, the, uh, for that one web page, right? And it's going to go down to rank number uh, 100,001, and you'll just get garbage. Uh, so the, 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 the total amount of time that the adversary messes up is just one out of 100,000. But um, the result that you get is, is not useful. Okay, so uh, I think now's the time when we want to take a break. Uh, so I'll be hanging around, and if you have questions in the break, then uh, you should feel free to come up and talk to me. Thanks.